In today's episode, we speak with Mark Fronmeyer. He's the founder of Arkimoto, a three-wheel electric vehicle manufacturer based in Eugene, Oregon. We discuss what led him to originally form the company, its growth in the EV space over the past 10 years, the outcomes of becoming a public company, and where they're going next. Greetings. Today, I'm joined by Mark Frommeyer, the founder and CEO of Arkimoto. It's been great to see this company grow in Oregon, being an Oregonian myself. So thanks for joining us today, Mark. Chase, thank you for having me on the program. Well, great. I, I would love to share uh, your story. I think is such a unique one and really cool how it's been kind of, it's gone through so many evolutions and just the traction you're seeing with the company recently going public. Um, just the interest I'm seeing as someone I've known about the company for a while, but now just seeing it go, I not even just national, but global headlines is amazing. Uh, so let's, let's just make it easy for anyone that maybe if they've been living in a cave or something, <laughs> they don't know who you are or what Arkimoto is and just kind of kick it off from there. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so Arkimoto, we're a, a ultra efficient transportation solutions provider. We build the uh, the fun utility vehicle, and it's actually a whole product family around uh, a new ultra efficient three wheeled electric vehicle architecture. Um, dual motor front wheel drive uh, carries two passengers very comfortably in the space, not much bigger than a big, big motorcycle. Um, and the, the, I guess the, the sort of the backstory of how I came to be doing this, you know, the, I, I never thought that I would actually be an entrepreneur. That was not ever a goal. Um, and certainly not a, an electric vehicle company entrepreneur, um, which is its, its own tr truly interesting adventure. Um, but I, uh, I, I went looking for a vehicle in 2007. I, I was looking for an electric ride for doing around town stuff. And, and really kind of the, I would say the, the, the inspiration for Arkimoto came from noticing the giant gap between the bike and the car. Um, I was at that time a, a committed cyclist, uh, didn't own a car. Actually, I still don't own a car. I do, ha I do own an Arkimoto at this point now, though. So I, I did finally get my ride, which is, which is good. Um, but there's, there's just this giant disconnect between how we typically use cars every day, which is by ourselves or with just one other person with a small amount of stuff doing around town things and what cars are really designed to do, which is carry five to seven people hundreds of miles at a time with a lot of gear. Um, and that disconnect creates just massive inefficiency in the overall transportation system. When everyone is carrying around 5X uh, what they need in terms of empty space, you gotta have all the roads be very big. You have to have lots of lanes. Um, and the vehicles that we use end up just sort of dominating uh, the, the urban landscape. I think something like 75% of the public space in New York is just there to move and park cars. Uh, about 50% of the average city, somewhere around that is, is paved over for moving and parking cars. And so the, the idea of Arkimoto was really, and what I went looking for was something that was human scale, um, right-sized for the kinds of trips that I do all the time and that, that really most of us do all the time. And when I couldn't find it uh, in the market, that was when, when I decided through a series of poor life choices to start my own company to go after it. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that's a, the great uh, summary, but let, let's take a step back because I think what you highlighted there about uh, how you define yourself as not being the traditional entrepreneur is pretty interesting because just having met you before and hearing a bit of your story, uh, can, can we take a step backward with how you got into entrepreneurship in general? Because um, it, it isn't what you might find at all in the traditional automotive space. It started with uh, game development and yeah. kind of taking some interesting <laughs> zigs and zags from there. Definitely. Uh, well, well so, so how I got started in entrepreneurship, and I can remember the conversation, uh, was when Jeff Janelle, who was a co-founder with me at Garage Games, uh, said uh, he was also the founder of Dynamics, which is the first game company that I worked at. I actually started working there right after high school. And then uh, after I graduated from college, came back and started working full time. Um, but uh, about maybe four years in, he, Jeff pulled me aside and he said, you need to quit and go start writing a new game engine 
And we are going to give that game engine away to independent game developers to help them make games. And as, as soon as you said, that, I was like, that sounds, that sounds like just the thing I should do. Um, and the, what, I what I think I realized was that, that uh, entrepreneurship can be a very powerful way of making change in the world. You know, there are certain changes that you can make through public policy. Uh, there are certain changes that, that, that nonprofits and foundations can go after. Uh, but there are also problems in the world that come from building new things and new ideas that shift uh, uh, how we behave collectively as a culture. And that, that was really when, it, when we got started on Garage Games, it was, it was to make a change in game development. It was to, make a, it was to enable uh, creative people to build their dreams. And, uh, and that, was, that was motivating enough for me to say, okay, I'm going to not be a you know stable day job kind of a guy and i'm going to go out there and um start start pushing the edge and i think that's uh perfectly exemplifies so many of the stories we've been hearing in the electric vehicle space for people who are kind of coming from a completely different realm and now kind of stepping into it and making a huge impact so from there you had your success there and then kind of um can you walk through yeah, where we that well, we, evolved in Arkhamoto. Yeah, we, we sold uh, Garage Games in 2007. Um, IAC came along and, and made an offer that the partnership couldn't refuse. Um, and so we, and, and we did that because we'd, we'd sort of put together a bunch of different pieces of, uh, of an overall gaming uh, pie that they wanted to create called Instant Action. And that left me with a, a peculiar problem, which is that I knew I knew what to do with equity in a game company and where to go in the game world and in terms of building next generation engine technology and, and games and so on. But I really had no clear picture of what to do with a pile of cash. Um, and so that was when I, I, I but I, I did have a very clear sense of, of the, the, the pressing challenge that is climate change. I mean, the, the writing was definitely on the wall in 2007 and I would argue that what we've been experiencing in, in terms of climate these last couple of years is just, um, there is uh, incontrovertible, overwhelming evidence that we need to dramatically shift our patterns or life as we know it is gonna be severely diminished. Um, and so I, I just, yeah, I just, at that point, I just really committed, I'd been talking a big game uh, about what we needed to do to fix the problems of the world uh, and all of a sudden I had resources. So that I, I just decided at that point, I was gonna pretty much put all of those resources to work um, trying to solve the problems. And I, I also had a, at that point, a pressing problem of my own, which is that I had uh, moved into a house and occasionally I needed some motorized transport to you know, make, the, make the home improvement store run or go visit the folks on a cold rainy night when I didn't wanna pedal my bicycle. And it was, it, it was it was that combo of, of looking for uh, a product that I couldn't find for me, wanting to do something meaningful for you know the the planet as a whole, and then seeing a three wheeled kit vehicle in a parade, and just kind of like light bulb. That was the light bulb was just that they're seeing the gap, really almost for the first time. Which is which sounds crazy, but you know you grow up and it's like there are bikes and there are cars. Um, and when I saw something that was like really cool looking in that gap between the bike and the car, uh, it just, it, it blew me away. Cause I was like, well, how is it that there is, there's not just a whole wealth of products, uh, a range of different things in this space between the bike and the car. Um, and I, over the next seven years, I would find out why uh, there weren't very many, if any, real solutions in that space, which is, is developing a three-wheeled vehicle is actually really tough uh, to get it right. Um, and so, uh, but that was, that, that was how, how I switched from being a, a video game coder to a, a electric vehicle entrepreneur was just, um, I, I had the, uh, I would say, um, irrational exuberance of a first exit from a software company which left me with the mistaken belief that 
uh, entrepreneurship was easy in all circumstances, um, which then allowed me to take on a, a substantially more difficult problem. I mean, hardware versus software, what's the difference, right? Yeah, right, totally. <laughs> so let's let's kind of go further with that. You said there was this kind of, you saw a vehicle that was already out there. And instead of just saying, okay, there's some sort of solution, you kind of went further and started exploring what that spectrum kind of in between is uh, and where those kind of challenges could be addressed and how to do that through electrification. Um, could, could you share what it was that kind of pushed you to take the entre uh, entrepreneurial leap to go down that path and then um, find out what some of those challenges were and where Arkimoto is really uh, thriving in addressing those uh, issues? I, I would say it was kind of a slippery slope. Um, I, I, I got one of the kits to start. I just ordered one of, and this is the guy, Mark Murphy, lives down in Cresswell, about 10 miles away. Um, he's been uh, doing, you know, just pushing the futurism edge of uh, super lightweight electric vehicles for decades um, and, and got some friends to help put it together. Um, because I thought at that point, like that was, that was it. That was what, that was what I wanted. But once we got it together, I was like, well, you know, it needs a little more storage and I, I, can't, I can't quite see out of it. It needs some comfort improvements. It needs to be more stable at high speed. There's a, so we, we put it together and then said, all right, what can we do? We'll make a few tweaks here and there. And it was that process of a few tweaks that led us to, uh, you know, say, okay, we need to start off from a clean sheet. Here's our, our real first idea for a product. Uh, then we put that in front of a bunch of people and said, is this something, because at that point I, I was thinking, okay, this, this isn't just for me at this point anymore. Like we're actually, you know, we're trying to figure out something that's going to work for a lot of people. Um, and that, that was what began that iterative process. And what, what I sort of figure out later, um, if a, a really smart guy by the name of Thomas Thurston explained uh, disruption theory to me. And this is Clayton Christensen's work, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, um, that, that there, a disruptor, and that word gets used all the time for many different things, but in, in the sort of canonical sense, a disruptor is a product that, or service that meets a, a utility, a, a real utility threshold for a market, but does so at a much lower price point. And so what we really did for the first maybe four or five years of Arkimoto was uh, figure out through kind of a binary search through the three wheel vehicle space, what the real utility threshold, utility need for the daily transportation market is. Um, and we, you know, we found out it needs two comfortable seats. It needs carrying capacity for some groceries. It needs to be able to go on all the roads. It, you know, it, and this is just through, uh, largely through thousands and thousands of anecdotal interactions with uh, potential customers. And once the, the trouble is once we got to that meeting the utility threshold state, we had a you know, 2,300 pound uh, three-wheeled behemoth on the road that didn't get to that real disruption in terms of cost of materials and energy efficiency and, and all the rest. And so the next, I would say, few years over, again, multiple generations of prototypes was figuring out how could we deliver that set of capabilities on something that was, you know, a quarter or a third of the weight of a car, could fit park three in a parking space, you know, really hit the sweet spot in terms of the right size footprint for daily travel. Um, and it really wasn't until that point, seven years in, that I, I felt like we really had the win. You know, we'd been, it, when I started, it was like, they, oh, there's gold in those hills. And you, know, you just start marching along, um, but uh, di didn't, find, didn't strike the vein until, until December 20th, 2014, when I finally sketched up generation number eight. And it was like, this thing's gonna win. Um, but of course, then it's, it, there's, there's a whole host of other challenges once you've got the right idea uh, or a right idea to actually making that real. And in a hardware venture, I mean, it was, it's, it's a considerable challenge. You, you have an exponential leap from software to hardware, and then there's an exponential leap from hardware to automotive. Uh, okay. There's a few regulations, it turns out, that you have to follow and fall right into and make sure 
win this, if that, and many more. Um, to, I guess to, uh, before we kind of go into that, uh, can you take, can you go through like a few of the iterations that really helped bring down the weight and what those kind of breakthroughs were? Because if I remember right, because I think I saw one of the earlier prototypes back for the first time, I think like 2012. And if I remember back then, it was, uh, it wasn't lithium ion in the battery packs, right? Well, it was. We started with lead. Yeah. Uh, because, and, and that's, I'm, I'm a, a, can be a stubborn guy occasionally. And what, what has kind of bothered me was uh, from, from the beginning is that the, in the, in the kind of Silicon Valley world uh, and really in, in general automotive, the, the problem of the electric vehicle has been posed as one of the battery and energy density. Um, in the world of Arkimoto, we have uh, the firm belief that the problem is about footprint. Um, that, that the only reason why you need uh, a super next gen battery um, is because you're trying to propel 4,000 pounds of material uh, 300 miles at a, at a go. When again, most of us are just traveling by ourselves or with one other person uh, on average 30 miles a day, median trip length, I think is like five miles. So uh, the, the only reason why uh, we, are, we are reliant on continued innovation in the battery is because we're trying to solve a super inefficient problem. Um, and so in the early days of Arkimoto, I was like, we're just gonna use lead acid batteries and we'll build something that's lightweight enough that that it, that that can still be a very good everyday electric vehicle, and uh, we didn't. Uh, the architectures that we built in those first several years were not uh, were, were not simple enough, were not light enough, were not small enough that lead was a viable product solution. And so we jumped in. I you know, think 2012 we built our first lithium ion uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, packed vehicle, uh, and then now of course we're using cutting edge lithium ion chemistry for our batteries. Uh, and the but, reality uh, was back then, it just wasn't cost effective either for the Delta true. of, yeah. Uh, but but the, the funny thing about it is that when we finally got to the right architecture, generation eight, generation eight is a, a vehicle architecture that actually could likely host a lead acid battery and still get a meaningful range and, and great performance um, for a certain section of the marketplace. Uh, and so, um, we, we did, I think, actually finally validate that original thesis. But uh, of course, the, the technology world has moved on to, to re some really impressive um, work in energy storage. And uh, the, the advantage for us is that you know, we, we, can, we can use cutting edge technology, we just use a lot less of it. Right. And with that eighth generation, I don't remember, is it currently a steel frame? Or at least that's what it, because I know that's what it kind of started with and then went through a few iterations. Is it, is so the. We've always built the frames out of steel. Um, yeah. We had uh, at one point, um, you know, moved to aluminum for the battery bay. But again, like, so, so when you're lightweighting a vehicle, um, you can either lightweight the materials. Uh, so if you want to make a, a lighter sports car, you move it to carbon fiber and aluminum and uh, you do lots of lots of tricks uh, with with the materials to make it lighter or you can lightweight the idea and keep the materials traditional and low cost um, and you know sort of easy to source anywhere in the world and so that the, we, we've definitely been uh, lightweight the idea first right. and then as we as we continually you know, we've, we've definitely adopted the the Toyota mantra of continuous improvement um, and so we aim to continually improve the energy footprint, the, the cost footprint, the materials, um, and the, you know, really the impact of every product we build on the world. Um, but we're, we're starting from a point uh, that, is, that is sort of aiming in the right direction from the beginning. So with that eighth uh, generation vehicle, was that that kind of constant improvement or was there a decent kind of engineering breakthrough that made it so it became a much more feasible vehicle in your mind? It was, it was, um, it was something that was sort of this blinding flash of the obvious after seven years, which was, why are we building a vehicle with a steering wheel? 
this thing needs handlebars. Um, and it, I'd, I'd sort of first had that notion in, I think somewhere around 2012, um, when I, like, what would this thing look like if it were more city scooter style? But by that time we were sort of like way into the development of the seventh generation uh, and, you know, shifting gears then um, was, uh, didn't appear like it was going to be a win. Um, but once we got Gen 7 on the road, I said, this thing is still too big, too heavy. It's going to cost too much. It's not going to be competitive in the market. Um, and what can we do? Uh, and that was, that was one of those, you know, Arkhamoto is, it, it was really, you know, seven years of seven nice tries. Like didn't, you know, your, your princess is in another castle. And so, um, it was at that point the the choice was either, um, you know, we we were still not getting funding on the scale that we would need to to really take it to a true market test. Uh, we were um, we'd just been sort of grinding it out with friends and family uh, uh, support, and that that had grown quite stale. And so, uh, it was it, the I, I just sort of said, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this up with handlebars and the occupants sitting like you would in a on a city scooter got a got my housemate to measure me I, I just I sat in a folding chair uh, you know because I figured if anyone's figured out acceptable ergonomics for uh, the the five to 95 percentile it's the people who make folding chairs so I just sat in a folding chair had my housemate measure me you know top of the head to the floor back to the tips of the toes and then, you know, I'm, I'm our sizing dummy. I'm six foot four. So I figure if I can fit in there, mo almost everybody can. And I just took that rectangle, copy pasted it, put the drivetrain on the front, the swing arm on the rear and measured it. And it was like two feet shorter. Uh, the architecture would allow us to actually use the chassis as the battery box and, you know, the, the main seating configuration. And I just looked at it. I was like, this thing is going to be hundreds of pounds lighter. It's going to be short enough that you can park it three in a space. Um, it's going to it just sort of in that one move. I mean, we, we went from building a 1,760 pound prototype to the first generation eight prototype was 1,023 pounds. So we chopped off that's like massive 40 percent of the vehicle's weight. Um, but it was at that point when I just looked at that architecture, I was like, this this thing is going to win. This has got a, this has got real win potential on it. This is what I was looking for. Um, and now we've got to go make it real. So uh, we, at that point, I, I, you know, the, I had to lay off pretty much the entire team, kept one engineer going, doing kind of the basic validation of this new platform idea. Um, I, I hired a guy uh, across the country who I'd never met, uh, a guy named Greg Thompson, to do the industrial design. He'd, he'd won the sports car design challenge on, on local motors. And I said, you know, hey, um, can I can I you know pay you on terms? And uh, you want to take a crack at this design puzzle? And he said, this looks awesome. Like uh, this is going to be a really interesting challenge because it it, the, the, it doesn't look like any vehicle that you've seen out there on the road, right? So how do you make something that's new, that's tall and short, and uh, how do you make that look cool and fun and and really live up to what the experience was going to be? But he he made a uh, super kick-ass industrial design renders. And I just, I took all that, you know, our, our basic technical study, uh, the, the renders of what it would look like, made, made one more run at the uh, venture world of San Francisco and, and Bill Hambrecht did our Series A. So that's what got us, uh, that's what got us going and it, you know, really got the company moving, uh, built looks like works like prototypes, did a marketing launch, accumulated a bunch of pre-orders, and then went public in order to build the factory and get through compliance and put vehicles on the road. And then what year was the Series A again? This was 2015, early 2015. So, I mean, that's that's a huge just uh, step forward going from that, getting all these things ready, getting that financing, and then obviously going from that to then finally going public. Um, what do you think, you, you mentioned just some of the challenges you had with fundraising. Um, obviously, between even 2012 and 2015, I think just the public psyche, let alone the psyche towards uh, electric vehicles, especially in the kind of uh, investment community had changed, but was still kind of hesitant. 
Um, and nowadays, it seems like anything electric vehicle is kind of the hot stock commodity item, and they want to be a part of it. But can you share what some of the, um, I mean, I'm sure it's probably this, the things you would think of, but can you share some of the pushback you were getting about why they would, why they didn't want to invest in Arkimoto? And then what was it that really kind of finally changed their mindset to push them over the edge to make that investment? Well, I, I think when I first, so you know, I kicked in the the first uh, couple million dollars out of the proceeds of the sale of garage games into starting the company um and i had we we bootstrapped garage games so we had you know, basically zero relationships in uh the silicon valley venture world um in the angel investment world it was just sort of like we each kicked in 10 grand and then sold it for a deal that totaled 50 million and so uh when when I went out to go fundraise on in, in Silicon Valley, nobody knew who I was. Nobody had any real sense for for you know what 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 was or was not possible uh, with me at the helm. And then uh, it was two, it was at that point two thousand nine. Uh, two thousand seven was a great year to sell a company. Two thousand nine was an atrociously bad year to go looking for venture financing uh, and. For, for particularly in electric vehicles. I mean, one, the, the, the housing crisis and recession had really uh, taken a lot of the wind out of the venture sales. And then every electric vehicle bet that they had made looked like it was going to zero. I mean, this was Fisker 1.0, Coda, Aptera, Tesla was, was totally on the ropes. Um, and I show up with this crazy three-wheel vehicle idea from Eugene, Oregon, uh, having zero experience in the automotive world and just got laughed out of every office. So uh, that was what ultimately turned me to friends and family. And then, you know, I had to make new friends and family stopped returning phone calls and, uh, but, but managed to, you know, we had I, I, the fundraising stories on, on Arkimoto in the, in the early days are, are crazy. I mean, like we had a, a, a spinal surgeon who was in town uh, on vacation with his family and they were looking for, a bathroom next to the restaurant. We had a, a design studio next to the restaurant. They kind of walked in and said, what are you, what are you doing here? Um, and and he what had, restaurant was that? So uh, this was a, a, a taco. It's in the Whitaker, right? Yeah, yeah. So Taco Vor. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Okay, that's great. Uh, fantastic tacos. Yeah. Um, and, and, and he looked at it, you know, he, he had seen what, what Tesla had done. He's like, this is, you guys are in the right direction. I was not actually there at the time. I was I was on a trip, and so it, I I didn't meet him um, for I think another year and a half or something like that. But in the interim, um, he invested substantially in the company and let us get to the next stage. Uh, and so so it, it, sort of like every time we were really up on the against the ropes, somehow some way um, the, the the right solution would come up to to let us move forward to the next step. Well, that sounds great because it just seems like the people who were invested in it too were people who fully believed in it and saw what the greater vision of it would be. Uh, and that that's kind of great to hear that. It, that is a common thread where it's just like, when it looks like things are going to end, it's always kind of this, whether it's luck or whatever you want to credit to, people just kind of come out of the woodwork who have the, the same uh, shared insights and want to see the succeed to really keep it going. Yeah, there, there was... It, and I think that also just the 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 sense that we were not going to quit. You know, we we every t although although you could argue, or and I I would argue that uh, the first seven years and seven generations were just you know sort of seven failures in a row. Um, every time we would get done uh, with with that sort of iteration, and it was it was both one each one was sort of closer to the to the success point, uh, and we learned a ton along the way uh, at each step, but we would also look out at the world and go, has anybody else really solved this problem? Uh, and are we perhaps still in the best spot despite, despite the, the, the surface appearance and the odds, are we maybe still in the best spot to really nail it? Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's really sort of what, I think what kept me going forward continuously was um, we need a solution to this problem. And we, I, I think ultimately we were on the right track. So 
um, that was, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely been a reasonable way to pass the time. And I, so that's, uh, I think that kind of transitions well to what Arkimoto fits into and some of these uh, kind of industries that your company's focused on helping address and the services you can provide. Because I remember like back in the day, it was kind of like quasi motorcycle, quasi car. It was kind of hard for trying to figure out where it actually fell into, but you also want to make it approachable and usable, which it definitely is as a vehicle. Um, can you kind of share who some of the industries that you've kind of first connected with are that are looking at purchasing Arkimoto for different services? And if there are maybe any that um, maybe surprised you or you weren't expecting? You know, it's it really, it, so so something to, be, to really think about is just that for almost, for all the fleets out there, there are a certain percentage of the trips that are one person traveling a relatively short distance with a relatively small amount of stuff or two people traveling a relatively short distance with a relatively small amount of stuff. Uh, and that when, when you're, when you're running a fleet and you want to make sure that you are, um, that, you, that you are solving your transportation problems in the most cost efficient way that you can, then, and, and you just slice it and you say, okay, well, this percentage of the trips out of our motor pool are, be, are fit this pattern. Uh, that percentage of our vehicles should be the lowest cost solution that can solve for that pattern. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's been fascinating to me to see all of the different use cases that have come up. And I, you know, we've, we've articulated a few of them in our current product line, right? The fun utility vehicle is kind of the everyday electric vehicle for getting groceries or for going out with a friend or for a vacation rental or sightseeing or, or whatever. The deliverator is, does very well at last mile delivery. It can deliver flowers. It can deliver food and pizza, giant load of groceries, uh, parcels, whatever. Um, but the basic platform can be modified for all kinds of different uses. You know, we've, we've had uh, discussions with maintenance repair crews that want to run, basically just run an air compressor and air powered tools for doing maintenance on campuses where they can zip really quickly between different maintenance needs. And then they've got really a, a lot of space and a lot of power in the vehicle to run a compressor and run tools. We have people who want to deliver uh, hot food and have a, a, a hot food option for the delivery vehicle. We have uh, people who, uh, you know, we, we ourselves use the platform for camera work. So we created a vehicle called the Cameo that lets a, a videographer sit in the back seat facing backward with just completely unrestricted view of the road. And if you've ever seen people try and record cars from like another car uh, where they've, you know, got the minivan back door open and somebody's kind of hanging out the back, uh, there's really not a lot in the market between that and the, you know, multi hundred thousand dollar camera truck. So in, in each of these cases, it's all about just looking at what is the, what is the task set that needs to be done? And can this platform, you know, solve that task set in the most cost efficient way? And what, what I think we're finding is that for a, a, a very wide range of the tasks on the road today, the Arkimoto platform is a, is a really good solution. Um, so, so that's, uh, I, I, and as we get, I think one of the things that, that, you know, you kind of alluded to, but just that the vehicles are now out there, that you can try them, that you can uh, see them coming down the road. Um, it, it's just a very different point in the company's uh, development process when, when somebody can, can get behind the handlebars, experience the real joy of the ride and kind of say, okay, I see this, how this can really apply to all of these different things that I do. So that, that's actually, that brings up a great point. Being this company that started in Eugene, now having this exposure, uh, let's say whether it's someone who wants to use it for their personal use or like a fleet operator, how, how can they kind of get in the seat of one or how do you see that as kind of the way to kind of allow people to test it out before 
um, they can actually go out and purchase one. I mean, I remember even driving it back in 2012 and I was like, this makes sense. It's a lot of fun. And it, I had kind of driven a similar, a couple similar things before. So I, I knew what I was expecting, but I think for a lot of people, they might have all sorts of different uh, misperceptions. And so I'm just curious how Arkimoto is maybe going, especially right now with uh, kind of come, finally coming out of the COVID uh, era of how kind of getting more or less butts and seats to really see um, how well the system works. Totally. So, so and, and, and COVID has certainly complicated that whole question. So as we were, our, our, our real initial, um, uh, I, I would say that the, 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 the kind of baseline experience the vehicle in market model for Arkimoto is rental. Um, and that's, that's distinguished for, you know, sort of distinguishes us from the traditional mode of franchise retail and then more of the kind of company store approach that say Apple and Tesla and so on have done. We think that that rental is um, going to be the most cost efficient way and, and ultimately should be a profit center for Arkimoto for that initial user experience. Um, we our first rental franchise opened in Key West pretty much right before vacation travel went to zero uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So but as that is comes back and as we come out of this 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 window, uh, that is going to be a real priority for us is to get rental locations open in areas where we want to have uh, a significant market presence. Um, so you can think you know, Southern California, Florida, uh, islands, uh, really anything that, that is a good destination spot where you've got vehicles for rent and they could be scooters or golf carts or whatever. We think those are very good places for us to put Arkimoto rentals. Um, we also, it, another the, sort of the next piece of that rental puzzle is vehicle sharing. And there, when you think about real urban areas, New York City is an absolutely fantastic place to ride Arkimotos. Winter, summer, fall, what, whenever you, it's, it's, it's a blast. You get across town much faster than you can in a full-size vehicle, uh, but you don't wanna own one in Manhattan. You got to have, have to deal with parking and uh, charging and all that kind of stuff. So, in places like that, you want to have an Arkimoto available, uh, but you don't necessarily want to buy it. Uh, and that's where we think it would it would make places like that we think would make fantastic Arkimoto sharing uh, economies. So you've got it, it, the fact that it takes up less space to park, it it costs less to charge. Um, and it, it maneuvers through traffic better. Those are all real advantages for urban environments. And so that's, that's kind of the second piece of the rental puzzle. And then finally, you know, we, we, we are definitely building the platform to be um, autonomous. Uh, and and I, I guess the original question here was more about user experience. So uh, the, but, but the, as that foundation of rental, um, that's, that's, that's sort of the the initial layer, and then the other piece is your your friend is going to get one. He's going to be driving around, big grin, plaster all over his face, and you'll be like, "You like it?" And hopefully, he says, "Yes, I love it, and this is a great machine." And would you like to try it? Uh, and so we plan for you to be able to actually share your vehicle, um, either just by handing over the keys or by using the app to allow somebody else to drive it. Um, when, when you're not using it. Uh, and that's, that's another piece where that's sort of just the network, the, the viral network effect of getting into market uh, builds its own, uh, builds its own momentum. And then of course, we will be doing things like test drive events in various places at, at uh, where, where lots of people congregate. Um, we're definitely doing uh, specific outreach to certain fleets to say, can we get you a vehicle that your team can evaluate for larger purchase? Um, and, and I think that that whole mix is really gonna be what lets us get people an experience of the vehicle without having to spend a massive amount of cash on retail locations and, and uh, at, or, or people who are taking a piece of the margin. Yeah, I, I think that, that definitely makes sense because uh, you're hitting on kind of two 
one's really unique, but the other uh, about just friends talking to friends. I mean, that's really been the most successful way for electric vehicles to take off is someone on the block gets an electric vehicle and word of mouth, they kind of hear, oh, he's liking it. Um, you see that with electric vehicles in general, that's exactly how Tesla got a lot of its early growth was yep. people just positive word of mouth. The rental part of it is really interesting and that totally makes sense. I'm curious, um, the example you listed was a franchise thing. So is this maybe a hybrid model of some that Arkhamoto would run and then some maybe would franchise? It would. It, I guess my question is, it, should we think of it more like I would download the Arkhamoto app when I'm in New York and get one like I would an Uber or would it be more like uh, I go on to Turo or whatever to rent an Arkhamoto or maybe a mix of both? I think we're, we're get, what we'll see over the next couple of years is, is a lot of experimentation by Arkimoto and our partners in various different models in various different places. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to do more of what works. So, you know, it's the old adage, you know, most stuff, you, you try stuff, most stuff fails. Uh, some works do more of what works. You know, it was like <laughs> Vinci who said that. Um, and that's, that's really what we're in the phase of doing right now in terms of the, the sort of the market entry uh, piece of the equation. Um, and, and yeah, you know, the, the Tesla, I think, has said on, on multiple occasions that the, it's really that word of mouth network effect that's been one of their key sales drivers the whole way along. Uh, it's just getting, having early customers who are incredibly enthusiastic about the product. And what we've seen is that our early adopters, by and large, have been very enthusiastic about the ride. Of course, you know we're also going through the throes of being an early vehicle manufacturer and and, and attempting to do service in the middle of a pandemic. So um, it's it's we're we're definitely aiming for uh, continuous improvement on that front as well. Uh, but my sense is that as we get through kind of this early uh, the, the early piece of production that we're going to have a, a very robust product and that the, the feedback we're getting is that people really, really like the ride. Uh, and I think that's going to be helpful for, uh, for, for scaling the demand in the market. Definitely. And I think that's kind of a great point. We, we've definitely kind of gone through the history of Arkimoto and kind of now getting up to the current. Uh, congrats again also for the recent IPO. Uh, but can we maybe talk about where Arkimoto is right now through um, the successful IPO? Uh, obviously, you've been working with uh, one of our other guests, Sandy Monroe, and trying to scale up production and trying to improve those kind of processes. Can you kind of work through what the last maybe six months have been through all of these big accomplishments and well, um, where Arkimoto is going? Yeah, we we actually went public in 2017, so we've we've been on the Nasdaq. We we were we were the second electric vehicle company to go public on Nasdaq. The first being Tesla. Um, wow, so we, my apologies. I thought it was I mistaken. It. I thought um, it was yeah. a number of folks have have confused us for a SPAC play, um, but we're we went we went public actually using uh, the the Regulation A uh, changes that went into the Job Act and Jobs Act, and we ended up listing directly after that. So um, we've, we've experienced the joys of being a publicly listed company now for more than three years, um, a, a, which, which is, has come with it, its own set of real challenges. I mean, I think the, the ultimate benefit for us uh, in, in being a public company is that we have a public mission and we want our customers to be able to be our shareholders and our shareholders to be able to be our customers. And, and so I, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, over the long run for Arkimoto to be public. But the, the, there's also the, the way that the market works in terms of just the, the short-term focus um, is, is not always perfectly aligned with a, a, a decades-long vision to Completely. radically reshape how we do transportation. Um, and so that's, that's been an interesting learning curve uh, to climb. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've definitely gotten, we, we were sort of from our IPO to the beginning of 2020, it just made, you know, made, made progress, uh, but, but certainly got uh, beat around in the market here and there. Um, and then it, with, with the pandemic, it was like the world suddenly woke up to electric vehicles and, we we had a, a really a, 
a, a substantial rise, to put it very mildly. I think that we were trading at about 97 cents a share uh, in March 17th of last year, and we're now I think somewhere around 20, um, which has allowed us to absolutely, you know, fully right size our balance sheet, um, really begin executing full pace on all of our plans uh, for the future and establish key relationships with uh, groups like Monroe and Associates who are helping us really plan out the next major stage of production. And so this is, you know, we're, we're building at a very low volume today. Uh, we did, we, we shipped 46 vehicles to customers in 2019, we shipped 97 vehicles to customers in 2020. But what we're aiming for is to be able to build out of our out, out of our Eugene campus, 50,000 vehicles per year um, uh, within the next couple of years to be able to be to have the capacity to build at that rate. Um, and and that's that's a, obviously a big step up. So um, we I think it's, it's it's just it's a it's key to us that we've got the right team in place to get that right. And that's why that's why we uh, teamed up with Monroe uh, is because that's just that is their uh, bread and butter and what they've been doing for decades. So kind of uh, let, let's go a little further, because I remember going to, as he said, the uh, is Archimoto still have the Whitaker location or has that changed yeah. since then? We're going all in on the wit. Yeah, no, we, great. We, don't, we don't have our original design studio. That is okay. It's now a, a barber shop and a, a <laughs> advocacy group for uh, better voting methods. Um, but uh, the we our our factory, our present factory, the the Arkham Motor Manufacturing Plant is sort of on the outskirts of the, of the Whitaker. Uh, but our the new facility that we uh, that we just signed a, a purchase agreement for uh, is is right right in the heart of the Wit, and we've got. Our R and D facility is is two blocks away from there, um, and our admin offices are going to be, uh, you know, essentially right on Blair. So it's it's uh, we're staying in the hood. That's great. I mean, just to hear uh, how you refer to it as a campus, that's definitely promising and just uh, awesome to see that kind of growth. Loose, loosely considered a campus. <laughs> that connect the Multiple various. buildings in the Whitaker. I think that qualifies. That that's great. Um, so you mentioned uh, COVID being just a crazy time for your company. And it is wild to see just how many people we've talked to about in the automotive industry in general, COVID was just a drop off. It's rebounded better than most people thought it would, but really by far globally where it stands out is just the adoption of electric vehicles have just stepped up. Yeah. Um, are, are there any other things you can kind of share when like maybe the lockdown started, what uh, was kind of going through your head and then just the pivots and kind of surprises that have um, come from that. Well, we, we, uh, by, by a strange timing, we launched the first pilot of our last mile delivery vehicle, the deliberator uh, about a week before we shut down production uh, due to the pandemic. And what happened right after that was last mile delivery 10 X for groceries, for meals, for, you know, Amazon, everything. It was just, that became the way that you got everything. And so th that was, and, and all of a sudden we had just put out what I would argue is, is for a certain class of delivery, the best uh, delivery vehicle in the market. Uh, we put out a, our rapid responder at nearly the same time, right as, you know, the, the needs of, of our first responders were coming into clearer focus. Um, the skies cleared in in major area in many metro areas of the world so probably for some people for the first time in their lives got to see what uh, what their what their cities looked like without pollution um and so that i think th those were some of the background factors just in this kind of shift in awareness and then people stopped traveling a long ways we've learned to work from home if if you if you're working from home right now and have really dialed it in over the course of the last year, are you going to want to jump back in your car and commute an hour and 20 minutes each way through traffic to get to your cubicle? I, I wouldn't want to do that. So I think the, the patterns that you know, some, some patterns will go 
sort of back to some semblance of what they were before. But I think a lot of the patterns of, of how we move around and how we look at the world, I think there are going to be some enduring changes from that that are sort of very favorable for the thesis of Arkimoto, which is that figuring out how to very efficiently transport ourselves and a small amount of stuff around a local area um, should become a more meaningful part of the overall vehicle market than the dominant pattern of how can I transport seven people hundreds of miles. Um, the, and, and I think as we look forward, the, the other piece of that is just that we are entering the area era of autonomy and, and touched on that a little bit before, but the, as, as you look at rideshare, for example, 80%, 85% of Uber, Lyft, taxis are just a single passenger. So as we, as we consider this sort of autonomous robo-taxi world that we're about to enter, um, the, the, it, is, it is not going to be seven passenger self-driving SUVs, I don't think, that dominate the road. I think it's gonna be right-sized, very small footprint platforms designed to take one or two people a relatively short distance with a relatively small amount of stuff. Um, and the, the great thing about the Arkimoto is it's actually really fun to drive it. So I, I can understand why you know, people would wanna jump in a robo taxi in, in sort of, uh, if, you're, if you're accustomed to the car and the, and the, the really non-joyful aspect that is driving most cars most of the time, I can see why you would wanna just get in and have it do the hard work and you, know, you can send some more tweets out or something. Uh, but with the Arkimoto, that piece of it, I think, I think people are actually gonna to wanna to drive, drive this platform themselves uh, for a long time. And autonomy presents a really nice way of just sort of getting you the vehicle you need when you need it. I, I completely agree. And um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of public transportation, especially when it's electric. But I, I do think there were some challenges it was facing before the pandemic. And I think moving forward, um, like, I mean, I remember when I was living in Portland, when I was going to go out to meet friends, I would take one of the uh, uh, BMW and Mercedes had that uh, car to go program. So it'd be kind of fun to drive a car, leave it, and then have some drinks with friends. And then I would take an Uber home. And that's yep. where I think that that perfectly aligns with that, where it's going to have fun to drive something before you go out to meet with friends, go have some fun, and then be able to go home safely in a way and not have to worry about it. And I think the scale and especially doing that fully electric and with a much greater speed and the safety um, of having just exactly what you need um, will really be moving forward a big part of it. I think um, public transportation definitely has a lot to still be uh, a part of the conversation moving forward. But I, I just think even with some of the arguments people make around congestion with autonomy and some of these things we're seeing, especially on the software side of really just being not reactive, but being much better proactively trying to take riders through different locations and other technologies, especially with um, even what you're talking about along with food delivery and these other delivery systems, I, I just think that the speed will kind of play into that is the future, whether there gets pushback from certain uh, ideas of it or not. And all things said, I think everyone wins. It'll be cleaner, it'll be faster, and I think it'll be uh, more cost effective in a lot of ways, especially in the long term, so everyone can have kind of a part of that. Um, that one. Yeah, oh, just to just to follow on to soliloquy. Yeah, no, no, no it's, it's good. But I think that the public transport piece is really important to, to note. There's there's definitely a component of Arkimoto that is about transportation equity. That is totally. that, that, you know, it, sustainable transportation ultimately won't happen unless the, the solutions for sustainable mobility are affordable by basically everybody. And so, you know, even in the autonomous robo taxi world, having a platform that costs uh, you know, a third of the cost of a full-size electric vehicle platform uh, that takes up a third of the space in terms of parking that uses much less energy to charge, those have direct equity impacts on those who are least able to afford mobility today. Um, and and that's, that's definitely a piece of what we are looking at and thinking when we think uh, our, we're watching as our local transit district, I think really starts to rethink their 
um, their, their, their reason in the world, which is, you know, it, it's not about being a, a bus service. It's about being a mobility provider and having the, having the right tools for the job um, for each of, of their customers is going to be really important. So we're, we're definitely looking at how does, how does this last mile platform solution that we've built uh, fit in with the, the sort of the overall tapestry of, of transportation. And I, I think that sums it up perfectly because um, I think even speaking from my own experience, when I lived in St. John's in Portland, uh, I had a Subaru Outback as a classic Oregonian that finally died after 320,000 miles. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Uh, Portland's got one of the best bus systems. That's going to be the closest thing to me. And even then I did it for a week and it was one way an hour and 15 minutes. And just for everything as like, as much as I want to be Mr. Like sustainable transportation, supporting good things, the two and a half hour time cost per day just did not make it worth it. And so I got a car again. And I, I think it's what I really like about your technology is it does make it not only cost effective and a success, uh, accessible, but I just don't think people are fully understanding the time um, penalty that people are paying for some of these systems. And I think there's a lot of smart people such as what you're doing at your company that are really helping move the needle to not only bring down the cost so a lot of more people can access it, but do it in a get time back so they can go do their hobbies, go be with their families, record podcasts or whatever the hell uh, people want to do. So I think, I think this, this is all great. I, I would be um, yeah, interested I mean, to hear. Oh yeah. Go for it, it. It, and I think there is, there is definitely a case for, obviously there's a case for sort of high density uh, long haul fixed route transport. So um, if, if you have major transportation corridors, you've got subways and light exactly. and high capacity buses. There is, there is that, that absolutely has a role to play. The, those solutions have a role to play in the transportation system of the future. But what we found is that when I, when I did the back of the envelope math, I was like, well, our solution is going to be more efficient per passenger mile than, than light rail. When you add up all of the times that the trains are running and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, um, that the, if, if we can make it cost less and be more efficient than the most efficient forms of today's public transit, that's, that's a huge win uh, for, for the public. I, I completely agree. And I, I even think even if it's a little more expensive in the short term, just that many people, and even if it needs to be subsidized for others to make it more equitable, um, just the return on it will pay back, I think, pretty quickly. But um, I realize we're kind of coming up on the top of the hour. So I, I would be just kind of curious. Uh, we talk about COVID, we talked about everything that's happening and just the shift from EVs from even five years ago to 18 months ago to today. And obviously one of the big things is now with the Biden administration, a lot of the things that they're trying to push are obviously very pro uh, electric vehicle. I'd just be curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, and then with your space, I'd be, I'd be curious to learn what you think, um, what you would like to see or what you think, whether that be from private or public to really make um, a big impact to kind of keep this momentum and even accelerate further for people getting into electric vehicles. Well, I, on, in, on, to the first question, uh, we have been obviously very heartened by the statements coming out from the Biden administration about vehicle electrification, about really stepping up to address climate change. Um, and I, I, I'm also just, as we've seen the, the vaccine, uh, deployment accelerate, I think having an administration that can really work effectively uh, sort of top to bottom um, to get things done is a very good thing. Uh, we are in, in the process of dialoguing with the Department of Energy about a, uh, a loan from the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Loan Program for really a, a significant piece of the funding of our uh, go, to, go to mass production step um, and all of these elements have, have a, a piece to play in that discussion. I, when, you, when you think about uh, transportation equity, when you think about 
really pushing the bounds of energy efficiency of vehicles. When you think about the fact that the transportation system isn't just the vehicles on the road, it's also the roads themselves. And so if we can make more efficient use of our asphalt assets, uh, that does good things for our cities across the board. Um, and, and so I, I think we've, I, I would say that the Arkimoto, in my estimation, the Arkimoto mission and story is on point for what I'm hearing out of DC. Uh, so um, we, we look forward to, to really pushing that dialogue forward. And then That's you're, to hear. The, the, the second question you had there was kind of more, um, I, I, I mean, we've really, we've really hit the big picture here from, from what I can tell. I guess I, the, the only other uh, sort of recent development that we've had is we, we did acquire our, uh, a company or did our first acquisition um, this quarter uh, in order to really establish the bounds of Arkimoto's, um, the, the, the space in the market that we want to play in. And I think what we're going to see uh, from our team is, is, is really a product family that goes from true micromobility. So you know, bicycle, scooter, light motorcycle class of vehicle, all the way up to what we do today. But that's, that's the gap that we want to, uh, want to really excel in and, and, and lead the way forward on in terms of products that, that make a meaningful shift towards sustainability. Yeah, and can you just share a little bit more briefly about the acquisition? Because the technology is really interesting. Um, and if there's anything you can kind of share about behind the uh, acquisition and what you're excited about and how, if we're going to be able to see this soon implemented in some of your vehicles. Well, I can't give away the secret too soon until we actually uh, show, you know, we want to do the ta-da uh, yeah. here. And I, I don't want to uh, jump the gun on the team, but it's... Uh, so, so the company is tilting a company called Tilting Motorworks, and their founder Bob Mile, super super sharp engineer, who really cracked the code on how to make a two wheel in front, one wheel in back, tilting three wheeler, um, and they, it, it, and what they their, their product uh, to date is ju is just a bolt on kit for existing motorcycles. Um, uh, Har you know, Harleys and Honda Goldwings and, and just, you know, sort of the big touring bikes, because a, a big challenge in that market space is that as, as you have an aging rider demographic that doesn't want it, they don't want to fall over that, you know, you think about some of those really big bikes when they fall over, you, it takes multiple people to lift them off the ground. Um, you, you dump your partner once and you're never getting back on that bike again. So um, it's a, it's a really interesting technology solution for that problem to, to turn a two-wheeler into a three-wheeler that gives you the real foot feel of a two-wheeled vehicle. Um, but that wasn't the reason, you know, we're, we're definitely going to continue that, that product line, but that wasn't the real reason why, why we teamed up. Uh, we teamed up to build something at the very other end of the market, which is um, in the much more of the very lightweight uh, bicycle scooter class uh, and, and to, to deliver a, a product that is, I think going to be, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very, very, very excited about it. Uh, it is, I think it is going to be, it's got some pieces of it, not just the tilting tech, but some other uh, things that we're doing that I've not seen done on any other vehicle before. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't wait to tell you about it but it's, it's going to be a while yet before we put that out there. So, this, this tech is not to go on our current products. This is, um, this is for really a whole new line that's going to be, uh, you know, our, our, the, the main team is focused very squarely on getting platform number one up to scale, mass production to solve kind of the, solve the car problem in a much more efficient way, much lighter weight way, the things that people are using cars for today. Um, this new line of products is about, you know, yet another order of magnitude reduction in weight and cost and uh, improvements in efficiency for the kind of true micromobility piece of the market space. And, you know, between the two lines, we really see that's, that's should be, should comprise that, that space should comprise 
the vast majority of trips in the, the sort of city of the future. Can you at least share when we might be able to expect to hear more or? I, I have a, well, we, we report earnings at the end of this month and I, I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna at least re regurgitate what I just told you. <laughs> and maybe throw, throw a few more tidbits in there. Okay, well, we'll make sure we have our listeners listen for any developments on that as well. But um, Mark, I just wanna say thank you. This has been great to catch up, hear more where Arkhamoto is. Uh, for those listening, um, where can they find out more? Where's the best if they're interested in um, maybe test driving one or uh, renting one? Arkimoto.com is our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, you can go to arkimoto.com slash IR or, or yeah, arkimoto.com slash IR if you're interested in uh, you know our investor documentation, public filings, earnings reports, and stuff like that. Um, and uh we are on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, and we are constantly dishing out content and updates and so on. We're, we're pretty, uh, we're, we're, we're staying to ground still in terms of in-market events for the most part. Uh, we, we sent a, our, our first vaccinated team member out to Daytona for bike week, uh, but until we get the whole team um, really uh, ready to, Ready to face the post-pandemic world, we're gonna we're gonna keep it chill on the uh, on the on the events front, uh, but uh, but we're still definitely getting um, vehicles into the market. We're gonna be opening up new rental locations soon, and so um, yeah, lots of lots of ways to plug in. Completely understand, and that's great to hear. So, uh, definitely look forward to speaking with you soon again when uh, when we can. Uh, maybe even test drive one in person, yeah. but um, definitely maybe on another panel. This, this has been great. So I just want to say you thank drove, you for your time. If the last time you drove was 2012, we, we got to get you back behind the handlebars here. So I mean, that weight savings kind of blew my mind going down from, I mean, what is it at now? Uh, it's the, the production version is about 1,300 pounds. Wow. My, the, the original goal I had was 1,460. And I can't remember exactly why I picked that number. Um, but it was, uh, it, that was the one we kept trying to get to and just couldn't get there with the previous architecture we had. And then of course, generation eight just blew way past it. So I, I think we will eventually get this, this, you know, subsequent iterations of, uh, our present platform will probably get under 1,100. Um, and we, we definitely have an efficiency. We're, we're like, uh, 173.7 miles per gallon efficient right now, equivalent uh for uh for city driving we want to in over the long haul we want to get that into the into the 200s at least so wow. we do see opportunities for continuing to improve the efficiency of of our of our principal platform i mean even what you said going from 2300 which is still by most cars today very light uh down to 1300 and if you're even able to get to that that's just that's mind-blowing so um, thank you again for your time today, Mark, and look forward to speaking with you again soon. Likewise, Chase. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to visit our website, connectingthegrid.com. There you can listen to our podcasts, contact us about sponsorship, or even be a guest on Grid Connections. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a positive rating on your favorite podcast or video streaming service. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out a lot too. Thank you again, and I look forward to us learning more together soon.